I already had learned very quickly that if I said I was angry, that I would be labeled as too emotional to be a good lawyer. I wasn't engaging in rigorous thinking. And also the fact that I was one of the few women in the class back then um, in 1973, um, that as you just noted, that emotion was going to be connected to my gender too. Like women are just too emotional to be lawyers. So all these years later, um, I went back and wrote about that. And I, and I asked this question, well, why is it bad to be angry at injustice? And isn't that actually kind of strange? Because what is, what does mobilize us to fight injustice? Sylvia and me. 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 Hi, I'm Sylvia Beckerman, host of the podcast series, Sylvia and May, conversations with extraordinary, inspiring women. Hi, I'm Susan Bandes. Um, my current title is uh, Centennial Professor of Law Emeritus at, at DePaul University. And I'm a civil rights lawyer and an academic and a writer and uh, other things as well, which I hope we'll talk about. So welcome to Sylvia and Me. Susan, thank you so much. I am so happy to, to actually have you on the show today. And just for full disclosure, you and I graduated from the same high school um, out in Long Island, Herrick Senior High, Indeed. just a short time ago. <laughs> so you gave, you talked a little bit about your, you know, what you do now. And one of the things is that you are considered one of the 20 most cited law professors in criminal law and procedure. That's uh, a, a pretty, pretty good uh, title or uh, description. Uh, that's absolutely great. And as you said, you're a scholar in the fields of federal jurisdiction, criminal procedure, and civil rights. And you're also a pioneer in the emerging study of the role of emotion in law. Uh, something that we don't usually think about. You know, we think about um, victims and how they're emotional. We think about, you know, other things and, and, and emotions, but we usually don't think about the law um, and, and uh, jurisdiction and, and laws that come down um, having anything to do with emotions. And you, I know that back, I guess, in 1990, you and other academics started looking into this. What actually made you even think about connecting law and emotion? Mm -hmm. A great question. I actually have to go back and, and say one thing about the, you were kind to mention that I was one of 20 top um, cited professors in criminal law procedure. And I just had to say to your audience that I was especially proud of that because I was one of only two women on that list. Oh, well, that I didn't see any place and congratulations. That is, well, that is fantastic. And I want, I do want to talk about that uh, a little after we, um, talk about what, why even emotion. And that's funny that you said you're one of two because women are so tied into emotion that, well, yes. you know, it, and we have a bad rap as far as that goes, but let's go back to the original question. And what that's even good. made you think about that? Right. Well, uh, yeah, and the, and the gender thing is very interesting and we'll definitely, you know, I hope talk about that as well. Oh, we a will. Uh, a couple of things. Um, so actually, um, I, I know you, I noticed you read, read the article that I just published, um, or actually it's not even out yet, but I, I, I posted it on, on a um, um, research network and, and I, I think you commented that you enjoyed it. So um, that, that article actually goes back to my first day in law school. Um, you know, I had been an English major undergrad and um, I didn't know what to expect. I did not have any lawyers in my family, you know, and, you know, and even though we just graduated high school a few months ago, as you said, <laughs> it was, it was also back in the day when women were not going to law school. So, um, you know, it, it was, it was, um, it was a journey and um I went to law school and I, uh, I wrote about the fact that on my first day I was reading this case, it was a contracts case, you know, and who thinks about emotion in contracts cases, but it was um, an infuriating case to me because this family's home got strip mined. They were on a hill in West Virginia 
And the question was whether they, um, and they sued, and the question was whether they would be given the amount of money it would cost them to rebuild, which was, let's say, um, $10,000, or the amount of money that their home was now worth. What's it worth, what's it worth to sell a, a home on a strip mine hill? $300. So the court held that they got the 300 instead of the 10,000. And we talked about this in class as if it were just a math problem. And I remember looking around at everyone and everyone was just, you know, writing down their notes and discussing replacement value versus market value, which was the doctrinal issue. And I was angry. And I thought, I wanted to say that. And somehow I already had learned very quickly that if I said I was angry, that I would be labeled as too emotional to be a good lawyer. I wasn't engaging in rigorous thinking. And also the fact that I was one of the few women in the class back then um, in 1973, um, that as you just noted, that emotion was going to be connected to my gender too. Like women are just too emotional to be lawyers. So all these years later, um, I went back and wrote about that. And I, and I asked this question, well, why is it bad to be angry at injustice? And isn't that actually kind of strange? Because what is, what does mobilize us to fight injustice? You know, and, and during my years as a lawyer, um, I worked um, first for the uh, appellate defender representing people who had been convicted of uh, felonies. I represented them on appeal. And then I was uh, attorney for the ACLU here in Illinois. Well, not here in Illinois, I'm not in Illinois right now, but where <laughs> I normally live in Illinois, I was deaf attorney for the ACLU, um, suing the government for all kinds of abuses of power. And what is it that keeps you going and that motivates you? Um, one of the things is anger and what else? Maybe compassion, maybe empathy. Um, a, you know, we use this phrase, a passion for justice. So how is it, you know, that, that I'm learning my first day of law school, that all of these emotions are off limits and are not going to contribute to my ability to be a good lawyer. So at that moment, I was not thinking in, in those terms, right? I'm telling you this now from my perch yeah. many years later, having thought back on it all. At that point, I, I was just you know, a kid really wanting to figure out how to succeed in law school and in my profession. So I wasn't even questioning it. So, um, okay, hang on one second. So um, yeah. as you said, you were a kid in, 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 in law school, uh, one of the few women going to law school. You're angry, you feel this, but you clamp down on it because what you're, you're just this woman in law school. So at what point did you feel that you could actually um, speak, uh, you know, actually talk about the fact that you were angry about this decision and maybe others? Did you go through law school holding this in and then all of a sudden explode afterwards? Or, you know, how, how did it come about? That's a great question. I mean, um, Carly doesn't have a simple answer, and I'm embarrassed to say that I think I went through law school. Uh, you know, law school, um, it's like it has a lot of unwritten rules that you have to figure mm -hmm. out. Maybe if you come from a family where, you know, you, you had a lot of lawyers um, before you, it's not like that. But for me, it was. I, I felt like I was learning a new language, and that was part of the new language, you know, um, just sort of that if you if you raise your hand and say um, this makes me really angry this seems unfair your professor would jump on you I think things are different now honestly uh, but this is how they certainly were and there's still some of this for sure if you say that seems unfair your professor will look at you like well that that's not a very um, legal that's term <laughs> legal that's not a very legal analysis um, miss bandies let's let, let's try to think rethink that in legal terms you know what what what, what facts are you relying on and what doctrine do you think they got wrong and you think well Okay, so that emotion is something I have to learn to put aside. That's clearly interfering with my ability to be a good lawyer. And that is the message that they give you over and over and over. And it took me years. Um, I would say, uh, you know, and I'm actually still answering your first question about, about what got me into writing about sure. this. So I went through eight years of practice at the Appellate Defender and then at the ACLU. Um, and I always knew, um, 
you know, that my anger at injustice was propelling me, you know, and keeping me going. I always knew that. But, um, you know, there was always this sense of, okay, but that's not part of how you think about what the law is or should be. That's just this thing on the side there that you keep to yourself, right? And um, so the, the moment at which I started writing about emotion in law um, was a few years into my legal career. I had just been writing about criminal law and procedure and, as you said, federal jurisdiction, which, which is a very sort of arcane lawyer's law. I mean, very important in its operation, but not, you know, but not something that um, lay people um, are exposed to much. And one day I read these two Supreme Court cases and um, one of them was about um, a young boy, Joshua Shaney, who was um, being abused in Wisconsin from the moment he was born practically, he was being physically abused by his dad and people were reporting it over and over and the social service agency was doing nothing. And um, finally, one day um, his dad beat him so badly that he was irreversibly brain damaged and um, spent the rest of his life in the hospital and actually died like a year or two ago. And the question before the Supreme Court was actually, um, uh, does it was clear that Wisconsin violated its rules, but does that violate the due process clause? Is there a constitutional problem here? And the court actually got into this discussion about compassion because um, the dissent um, said, uh, we feel terrible, you know, we, we, we feel such compassion for Joshua, what happened to him is awful. And one of the dissenters actually wrote a very famous sentence, poor Joshua, exclamation point. And everyone else, every, and this has become, people make fun of him because he put an exclamation point in an opinion and because he expressed his feelings, right? His but real the, feelings. His feelings, the majority said, basically, well, you know, you can, of course, we all feel terrible for Joshua, but that's not, but the, but the court's job is to put those emotions aside and just look at the law. And um, compassion has no place in the law. And the, the dissenters were saying, we're not saying that this is just about compassion. We're saying that in order to think about what the due process of law means, we have to think in some ways, we have to have some empathy for what happened to Joshua. And it, it's very interesting, actually, because I would say that the majority was using empathy for the state of Wisconsin and, and the social service workers, but they didn't see it that way, right? They said, oh, we're just following the law here. So that case was decided the same year um, the, the, for the victim impact statement case was decided. And that was the case that said that it's okay for the relatives of someone who's murdered um, to give victim impact statements in court, um, talking about the uh, effect of the death on their family, on what impact it had. So and, and impact, they, impact. No, that's starts, a you're picking up on this. They never use the word emotion, right? They keep trying to say, well, it's information. But in fact, what they want, what they're allowing the family to talk about is why was my you know, son or daughter, whoever I lost, special what impact has it had on the family and i'm thinking i just got confused at that point i was just confused i said they just said in this deshaney case joshua deshaney's case that compassion plays no role in the law and now they're saying but we you are allowed to get up and talk about your um sadness your compassion or you know all those feelings when you lost somebody in a murder and i just thought well I wonder what role compassion should play in the law. I think I'll spend like about an hour researching this and 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 just answer it for myself. And, and that did it, and did it take longer than an hour? Yeah, it's been what twenty years so far, I think. <laughs> Let's talk about some of some of the the emotions, um, you know, because reason and emotion is something that uh, has has you know, as you said. You're not supposed to put the two together when you're talking law, but there are emotions. You, it's difficult, no matter what, to you know, as you said, that one descendant put an exclamation mark after you know, poor Joshua. We have emotions, and to take that totally out of uh, decision making, and and 
Loring is you're looking for a decision. You're looking for whether the jury makes it, the judge makes it, the Supreme Court makes it. They're making decisions. And it would be hard pressed to really be able to say with all honesty that emotion is taken out of every decision that's made. So let's talk about some of them. I know that you've talked about um, fear, um, anger. There's one that you talked about, which you almost call an umbrella of emotion, and that word is closure. Yes, yes. Can you talk something about, you know, a little bit about the word closure? Yes, yes. I, that, that's, yeah. Um, closure. Uh, it, it's very hard to, how do I want to say this? Um, you know, I'm going to have to say closure. If, if you talk to psychologists, if you read, if you read about post-traumatic stress syndrome and how people recommend treating it or, or healing after grief in any respect, um, I don't think you know, that you would probably find much mention of closure. I, I closure, I think is a term that that the law basically made up. Um, and uh, in the late 1980s, uh, early 1990s, and the victims rights movement, which has done many great things, you know, victims used to be shunted aside, they used to be treated very poorly, they weren't told when the court was convening, all, you know, they weren't told when people were being released. So all of that needed to be fixed still much much of it needs to be fixed and the victims rights did many great things around those issues but um one of the way one of the places where i you know i'm not comfortable with what with what they've they've accomplished with the help of the court system and the legislative system is um they they <laughs> uh there's now become this idea that um victims or their families are entitled to this thing called closure and that that will be brought about if we're talking about a capital case mm -hmm. by an execution by a death sentence and an execution so you'll have prosecutors telling the victim's family members in a, in a capital case um you know you should really sentence this person to death so that you can give the family closure and that's and um, a colleague of mine did a little uh, little research and found out that closure is a word that actually cropped up for the first time in the 1990s in, in the criminal justice system. And it never cropped up before. And what's interesting is within 10 years or less after that, um, a, a, a popular poll, an ABC News poll, asked people, do you think that um, capital punishment is justified because of closure? Um, a vast majority said yes. So within 10 years, basically, people had been convinced that there's a psychological benefit to executing people and that we owe it to victims' families to execute people so that um, the families can feel closure. And so I started looking into it. And, I, you know, like most people, I just assumed that it must be a venerable psychological concept because it sure sounded like one. But when I started looking into it, it wasn't that at all. Um, and as you said, I, you know, I concluded it, 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 it includes lots of different things, some very legitimate things, like if you lost somebody to murder, you would certainly, you know, want very much to know what happened in the last moments, that kind of thing, or even, you know, who killed them, things like that, which the criminal justice system is supposed to do and it's, is um, pretty good at doing usually. But is the criminal justice system good at helping people heal? And is a capital sentence the right way or an execution the right way to make people heal? You know, that's a, that's a psychological claim. And I didn't find anything out there to bear that out whatsoever. So that's an example of, you know, me saying, um, look what's happened here. I'm, and getting back to your earlier point, look what's happened here, it's interesting. You talked, you know, quite, correctly about the fact that the law claims it's it's an emotion free zone right and you know that we should keep emotion out but look what happened here it's just the opposite now suddenly we're claiming that all kinds of legal 
um, you know, very serious life and death legal decisions should be based on claims about making people feel certain emotions. And in this case, totally ersatz emotions that there's no evidence of. Okay, so let's go on to another emotion, fear. Mm. Yeah, that's one I, I want to write more about. Um, you know, I've been thinking about it a lot in terms of, of what, what we're all thinking about right now in terms of the unarmed killings of Black men by police. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good example of why I think it's important to look at emotion. You know, and, and just to sort of um, clarify one thing, uh, people often say to me, why do you want to bring emotion into law? And I always say, I, I don't. It's there already. It's there. That's the thing. Yeah. And, 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 and no one, the law is supposed to be emotionless, but people are making the law, people are breaking the law, people and people are made up of emotions. Yes. And when we say, put them aside, which, you know, as I said, I've been told since my first day of law school, um, that's not what happens, right? So let's talk, you know, so we saw the example of closure where the law actually creates all kinds of claims that don't bear scrutiny if you look at psychology. Uh, let's talk about fear. Um, so the rules on excess, police excessive force really are all about fear. You know, and, and they're about, um, on paper, they're about whether the police officer has a reasonable fear um, of death or bodily harm that would make it okay for him to use a certain amount of force, right? Um, but when, you know, then you watch these, um, like in the Derek Chauvin case, for example, uh, you know, George, uh, the killing of George Floyd, mm -hmm. um, you know, you watch these videos and, and now we have the videos, thank goodness, um, because we know what we had before that. We just had, you know, usually the police officer or the union representative's account. Um, but, uh, you you see um, if you you know if you were able to watch any of that trial or read about it um, it was all about um, whether Chauvin was reasonable in his fear but um, they painted um, Floyd who of course was under his knee you know as almost of superhuman strength um, you know we're using a, a trope that's racially based here, right? Um, that's what we're calling on the jury to, to call to mind. Um, so there, it's not, you know, so fear is actually part of the legal test here, you know, re reasonable fear of, um, you know, death or bodily harm, depending on, you know, the particular statute. So again, we've got the emotion in the statute here, but because they say reasonable, they're saying, well, we're, we're, it's an objective test. Would a reasonable police officer feel fearful in this situation? And notice not only were they talking about um, their, you know, their allegations of how strong um, George Floyd was, but he's got a fear of the assembled crowd, right? They keep coming back to that. Here's this crowd and they're yelling at him and um, he must be fearful of that as well. So how do you evaluate that? So two things, how do you evaluate that fear? And secondly, why are we only talking about what the police officer feels and not about what George Floyd feels? Yes. So there's all kinds of choices being made there, first of all, about whose point of view we want to take it from. Then there's this sort of claim that because it's what a reasonable officer would feel that we're somehow not asking people what they really feel in their hearts. We're really asking, you know, it's an objective test as we call it. But, but the fact is, if you were following this, you know, you probably saw that it's, it's, it's calling on these tropes that are implicit and sometimes explicit about fear of black men. And that's what, you know, that's what makes it work for the police over and over, right? It's, um, it's not written anywhere. It's just that, you know, as you said several times, we come to the table with all our emotions and all our assumptions about human behavior and all our life experience. And, and the prosecutor knows that very well. And he's saying, look how fearful he must have been of this huge black man and this out of control black crowd. No, he doesn't have to say the word black for that to happen. Right, right. Uh, they just, you know, figure everyone's going to know what they're talking about. It's, uh, you know, they, they've made it so it's implied. 
you know, again, emotion is playing in there. They're, they're playing on people's emotions. And one of the things you, you wrote an article from Dragnet to Brooklyn 999, how cop shows excuse, exalt, and erase police brutality. Now, we're not talking about police using force when it is necessary. We're talking about perception and, 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 and emotion that are tied into this. Can you talk a little bit about you know, that, that uh, article that you wrote and, and the, the cop shows that, yeah, yeah, Dragnet. We grew up on Dragnet and, yes, and all did. of that, yes. I learned something when I started researching this article, um, which is that <laughs> Dragnet, uh, which was the first, and then Highway Patrol um, and the FBI yes. were acting were actual propaganda efforts. Uh, and I'm not being hyperbolic here. Dragnet was actually um, the um, LA Police Department um, did this in concert with the creators of the show. They needed a show that would put the LAPD in a good light. You know, we were sort of really? coming at the old, um, um, uh, now I'm blanking on the name of the, those. Um, oh, um, Keystone Cops, right? Yes. You know, that's yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The, you know, sort of the old bumbling Keystone Cops. That they wanted a different view, a, a different portrayal of the cops. And and LAPD actually created this show and had total creative control over what did and didn't go, get go into the show Dragnet. Um, and they insisted on portraying the cops as you know straight ahead honest as the day is long integrity you know bravery um all of that was in the show and if anything wasn't like that it would get it would get taken out in exchange for you know a lot of things like um that the show was you know given all kinds of help with scripts they were given um help with location they were given um free use of of like cop cars and other um accoutrements so it was a very you know explicit partnership and then um uh highway california highway patrol said wow that's cool we'd like a show like that too and so that happened along the same lines. And then J. Edgar Hoover wanted to show like that about the FBI. So those shows were all literal propaganda with complete script control by law enforcement. Now, so, you know, flat, fast forward, um, later shows didn't have that kind of explicit control, but interestingly, that sort of portrayal of the cops, um, you know, as, as you know, the, the integrity, the, the courage and all that never really wavered. And I mentioned Brooklyn 99 because we've gone through some really interesting shows here. I personally love cop shows. You know, The Wire is, in my opinion, like probably the best TV show ever made. I loved NYPD Blue. We're dealing with much more complicated characters here, but you just never see cops beating people up for no reason um, you know, they're always doing it for the good of the people. Um, and part of it is it's oh, the show is always from the cops point of view. You always get to know the cops, their families, their brotherhood at work. You know, what's at stake if they don't go home? You know, they're, they're little children waiting for them. Get to know all of that. But you don't get to know that about the neighborhoods they're, they're patrolling. You know, you, 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 you get a much narrower view of, you always know who the perpetrator is. You're usually, you know, given some clue that it wasn't such a great person, you know, almost subliminally in a lot of these cases, wouldn't be so bad, you know, if we got this guy off the streets or even, you know, permanently off the streets. So, you know, a lot of it is to do with empathy and perspective. Um, empathy. Okay, there, there, there's another one. Yeah. Um, so now we have, we, we've had um, closure, we've had uh, empathy, we've had fear, we've had anger. Uh, there's another one that uh, you've talked about, which is disgust. Ah, yes. 
Let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, because there's so many things that as human beings, we really are just disgusted about. You know, they're just not something that we like and some things we find absolutely gross and disgusting. How does that play into any of the decisions that are made, the laws that are put out there? Um, so- right. Right. Actually, you know, I, I myself haven't written a lot about disgust, um, but my book, I actually have two books now, but my first book was called The Passions of the Law. Um, and that was a book of essays. And my two favorite essays in that book, one was by Martha Nussbaum, you know, the great moral philosopher and lawyer. Mm -hmm. Um, and she wrote a beautiful, provocative article about disgust, um, where she said, disgust played a role it plays a little role, played a role, you know, in, in early civilization, you know, it basically keeps you away from rotten meat, things like that. She said, you know, so that was an important instinct, but how does that play out in the law? And she took a very strong position against it. She basically said, disgust is never helpful for us in law because um, it basically is about uh, feeling repelled by, things that are animal-like. And what that's translated into is kind of a fear of sex, especially like a misogyny and a, and a, um, a fear of, of homosexuality, you know, things that we find to be just different, um, but different in a, in a kind of a very bodily sexual way. So she basically says, you know, whenever we make laws that are based on disgust, you know, we end up with things like the transgender, anti-transgender laws or anti, anti-gay laws and anti you know misogynistic laws and then in the next chapter I have um, Dan Kahan another law professor saying oh no disgust can be really helpful because it can it can it gets back to my anger point it can say let's be outraged at this we could be disgusted by um by Derek Chauvin you know, with his knee on George Floyd's neck um, for eight minutes, we could be disgusted by that. So if you notice what I think has happened here is that I think they are defining disgust differently, um, right? Um, and it was a very interesting debate, but it, it shows you something, you know, when you talk about emotion and emotion words, you, you know, you have to figure out if you're on the same page or not, because there's no single definition of any of these words. No, there isn't, and that's the thing. And there's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, laws that are coming in front of the Supreme Court now. One in particular, um, I haven't asked you anything about this, and we didn't talk about this before. But as you were talking, and we were talking emotion, um, Roe versus Wade is coming up before the Supreme Court. And you can't tell me that these people, they're judges, they're judges for life, and that their decision is not going to be based on emotion. some emotion. Absolutely. I, and anyone who says that's not true, um, I no, don't know. Not, yeah, I mean, uh, what, one of the examples was um, the case, uh, I'm not going to remember which case it was, um, but the partial, what they called the partial birth abortion case, you know, which was, uh, which was a case that had to do with late term abortion. Um, and uh, Justice Kennedy actually um, based his whole decision on his notion that women regret their abortions. And, you know, there you go, right? So, um, you know, and, and and that, and that and that then led to Dr. Diane Green Foster writing, doing the turnaway study, 10 years of because one of the things he said was, but there really isn't enough data. But yes, he's, yes. He yes. said he said something like, um, we don't have yes, right. I, I, he, he basically admitted that he didn't have the data, but he said something like it is unremarkable to assume. So basically he said, I have no data to support this, but I'm going with this assumption anyway. That's basically what he said. And then of course, as you say, everyone comes, everyone who actually has data says, by the way, there is data 
and it doesn't support what you said at all. But but that in a nutshell is what is what we're dealing with here. We're saying no emotion in law, then we're we're taking away the right to choose of how many women, how many, you know, hundreds, thousands, millions of women based on Justice Kennedy's gut feelings about regret. And that's what happens when you don't study emotion. You know, again, it's it's my point. I'm not saying we should bring it in. Look what just happened. He made an assumption. He didn't even bother to look at the social science. Okay, so we're going to go back to kind of this kind of leads into women and the law. You were one of two women named the 20 most. Uh, how do you see law and, and, and women? How has it, ha has it um, evolved at all? Uh, where are we? Mm. Mm. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, it certainly it has evolved. You know, the, the year I went to law school, 1973, um, uh, the year before mine, 11% of the women at, you know, at Michigan Law School where I went were women, and my year it was 22%. But, you know, it was still very, you know, even some professors I admired were, and they were making fun of us for wanting to be called Ms. I mean, there were, you know, it was actually very explicit sort of put, put downs in the classroom. That kind of thing, um, I'm sure happens way less now. Um, you know, women are about half of law students now. I am probably not the one to talk to about all the latest statistics on this, but I do know that, you know, women still, you know, have a long way to go to, you know, for any kind of equity in terms of um, in, in, in law firms and partnerships, um, you know, this last year, you know, and this, and this is not just a law related point, right, but this is just mm -hmm. a point of what the pandemic did, you know, in terms of childcare and the kinds of options women have facing them. Um, it's been, I think it's been a devastating year for lawyers and, and female law professors, and we actually do have quite a bit of um, evidence coming out that uh, women in legal academia, a, a, and actually in oral academia, mm -hmm. haven't been able to write this year, you know, and, and a lot of pre-tenure women, you know, had a devastating year um, on their tenure clock. So, um, you know, th these are not, some of these points are not specific to law, you know. Right. No, I, I understand. So one of my, maybe my last question, who knows, I might think of something else, but you, the with the um, small percentage, which may be growing of women in, in the legal um, arena, your uh, focus is on emotion and law. How in heaven's name does that really fit being a female attorney? Um, yeah. and, and, and because as we talked about at the very beginning, women are supposed to, you know, we're labeled as emotional, we're labeled as having, you know, too much passion, too much emotion, too much anger, too much aggressiveness, too much whatever they want to put on. So how has it been for you in, in this is your field? Yeah. yeah. Law and emotions. Such a good question. Um, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, I, um, I didn't do this on purpose. It just happened this way. But, you know, in my pre-tenure years, um, I hadn't discovered it yet. You know, I told you my story about that, those two cases that came down that sort of, you know, flipped a switch for me. I already had just received tenure at that point, writing about federal courts, federal jurisdiction, criminal procedure. Those were male, those were male um, fields, you know, um, and, and I had established my street, my street cred. Like I could, I mean, I hate to talk this way. I'm just, this is how it was. I, I showed that I could do serious law, right? And then I got tenure. So I'm not saying that I deliberately waited, but I am saying that had I started off doing this, I don't know what would have happened because it's a struggle every day um, to get this taken seriously. And there are men writing in the field, but um, it's, it's really a lot easier not to. Um, you know, it's easier, 
you know, and, and I've had discussions with men who say, why don't you just say, why don't you just call it psychology? Or why don't you just call it social science? And I'm saying, because what I'm writing about is a very specific thing. And it's not just about emotion. What I'm writing about is law's attitude toward emotion and why it doesn't want to talk about it and why it does think that it's so feminine that it can't be taken seriously. So that is what I'm writing about. And so as you can, you know, as you obviously can see, um, I get a ton of pushback and the pushback is in some ways a really interesting part of the story. Like I've, why are, why are people so, uh, you know, I, I, I can, I'll tell you a little story, um, okay. which I may, may start my book with. I'm, I'm starting to write my monograph on, on this topic. I, I was giving a talk at, at a major law school and about this topic. And this one male professor was just getting so angry he was just red he was so angry at me why do you want to talk about emotion and I tried explaining it a few times finally my host said to him you know who is his colleague said to him why are you getting so emotional about this (laughs) (laughs) and here's what he said he said well you know it's like um when we meet people in in public We know that they are naked underneath their clothes, but that doesn't mean we have to talk about it. Okay. That was, you know, let's not, let's just, we know it's there. Just let's just not call attention to it. Let's just pretend that the system exists without it and we'll all feel more comfortable. That apparently was the message. And, you know, as I hope I've, I've given you some powerful examples of, When we do that, people get sent to their death or to prison or lose their homes or, um, you know, or lose their right to choose. Uh, All kinds of consequences occur when we just refuse to acknowledge, you know, part of what is propelling our decisions and and refuse to acknowledge, you know, that there's information from social science and philosophy and elsewhere that could have helped us if we weren't ignoring it. Well, Susan, um, this has been exceedingly interesting. I'm so glad. I've, uh, I've loved it too, Sylvia. It's so good to talk to you. Uh, emo- emotion has, you can't take the emotional part out of life. It just, it, it just can't be done because when we try, we probably do the exact opposite. Correct. And it winds up hurting us, hurting people, hurting, making ridiculous uh, laws. Emotion is, is a part of life. It really is. And uh, Susan, I give you kudos for, for just plugging forward with this. Where can people find out about you and your books? Actually, I, I have a website, Susan. Bandish. I know you do, I, but I need you to tell us. Oh, yes, of course. So SusanBandys.com, I've got, um, it's my web, my personal website. I've got all my uh, articles and, and notice about my books and a, a bunch of podcasts and interviews I've done, some of them very short, which would, um, so that would be a great way to get uh, to know my work. And thank you for those who are interested in doing that. I Susan, welcome you. I want to thank you so much. Um, as I said before, this, this has been great. Uh, we all have emotions and I am so um, glad that you're actually, that you're plugging at this because we need, the knowledge needs to be out there. You can find us on all of your popular podcast platforms and of course our website, sylviaandme.com. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay tuned. <laughs>